in this screencast, we're going to look at uh, some chemistry of aldehydes and ketones, um, specifically um, the addition of weak nucleophiles such as alcohols. And in a subsequent screencast, we'll look at um, the addition of amines. So first, let's recall that um, a, a carbonyl group can undergo uh, addition. And so let me just put... Uh, a general uh, carbonyl containing compound. So if if R1 or R2 equals H, then that is an aldehyde. So R1 and R2 are carbon, that is a ketone. So we're really focused on um, the carbonyl uh, in this screencast, and depending on what these are, you either have an aldehyde or a ketone. So when we look at the carbonyl group, put the lone pairs in, we know that because oxygen uh, is more electronegative than carbon, we can assign that delta minus and the carbonyl carbon delta plus. So this tells us something that this carbon is susceptible to nucleophilic attack, but we can also see that in a resonance form. So here's our resonance arrow. Again, a resonance arrow is a double-headed arrow, and if we show the electrons in the pi bond, again, moving up to oxygen, so this double-headed arrow indicates that two electrons are moving they're pointing in the direction of delta minus, so that's fine. We end up with this resonance hybrid. Now oxygen has three lone pairs, a formal negative charge, and carbon has a formal positive charge. So this is a resonance hybrid, minus plus balances out to neutral. We start with neutral, so we're obeying um, our Lewis dot structures. So this is useful because um, it's saying that the carbonyl carbon can be attacked by a nucleophile. So what is a, a general uh, way to look at that? So if a nucleophile is supplying two electrons and we're reacting that with a carbonyl containing compound, and I'm going to draw this a certain way with... Um, this R2 group projected away, this R1 group, um, excuse me, R2 projected towards you, R1 projected away. I'm going to actually put some sort of stereochemistry in with the lone pairs as well. You have one away, one towards you. So we're sort of looking edge on. So because the oxygen is delta minus, the carbon's delta plus, the nucleophile will actually attack the carbon. We can then break the pi bond. And so notice the flow of those arrows. Again, this double-headed arrow signifies that both of these electrons are going to form this new bond. This double-headed arrow, notice the flow. We have, we have the start, it's flowing this way, and then the start, and then the finish. So the, these two electrons are going on to oxygen. Now, because this is an sp2 hybridized carbon, when we form this bond, the hybridization then changes to sp3 hybridized. So let's go ahead and, and show that. So this is another reason to sort of draw it this way, is that you can now see essentially if, if these three groups are different, nucleophile 
R1, R2, you can see that this is now a stereogenic center because you have four different substituents on it. So you're, you're basically going from something that's sp2 hybridized and would be a chiral to something that's sp3 hybridized and now is, is chiral, but this would be now racemic because you would get this plus the enantiomer. So um, what we are going to look at is um, what, what type of nucleophiles we can add. And so in this first screencast, we're going to look at uh, oxygen nucleophiles and um, see how the addition of, of these type of alcohols forms an equivalent functional group to an aldehyde or a ketone. So let me just preview that reaction. So say we're taking this aldehyde called benzaldehyde. Again, we count one, two. We can say this carbonyl carbon is at an oxidation state of two. And we're going to react that with this following alcohol. So 1,3-propane diol. And we're going to do this under uh, acidic conditions. So I'm just going to write hydronium ion H3O+. And so what happens in this forward direction is we're going to get a condensation of these two alcohols at the carbonyl carbon. And in the process, we're going to lose water. So we lose the elements of H2O. So here, here, and here. So some instructors say we would lasso those elements out as water. So there's the water generated, H2O. And so now look at this carbon. We started from sp2 hybridized. We're now at sp3 hybridized. But if we count, we still count 1, 2. It's still at an oxidation state of 2. So this is neither an oxidation or a reduction because 2 goes to 2. So essentially, it's, it's a functional group uh, equivalency. So where we call this an aldehyde, we now call this an acetal, is the most general term. And obviously, this is water. So notice the nature of this arrow that I drew. So these are equilibrium arrows. And so... Uh, what this is telling us is that we can favor either the reactants or the products based on Le Chatelier's principle. So what, is, what does that mean? If we want to form this, we can drive the equilibrium this way, say by removing water. So one, we'll, we'll put one way. Remove water as it is formed. So again, that's going to continuously drive this equilibrium towards the product. Another way we can drive the equilibrium. So add excess of one starting material. So if we have benzaldehyde, say in one molar equivalent, and we use 10 molar equivalents of this, we're going to consume this uh, much faster to push it towards this acetal. So that's one way to, to go in the forward direction. If we wanted to go in the reverse direction, we would basically flood the reaction with water. So we would add more water and it would push it this way. So that's what we're talking about when we're controlling this equilibrium. So... This being a reversible reaction, um, let, let's talk about 
the mechanistic transformation of taking the aldehyde plus this diol under acidic conditions to the acetal. And uh, under this reaction, uh, really, it's, it's a lot of proton transfers that are initiated by the acid. So we'll walk through that, um, and then we're going to look at uh, the, the types of acetals that exist. So there's, there's a couple different ones, and it's based on whether we're starting with an aldehyde or a ketone and what, what sort of alcohols uh, we're, we're looking at. So we'll keep, we'll keep uh, everything on this slide. We'll show the mechanism in this space here. So uh, first things first, we're under acidic conditions. We have an acid. We're going to use this as our base. We're going to protonate it. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep things pretty straightforward and just write the hydronium as H+. Plus. So being under a s equilibrium conditions, notice the plus charge now transfers to the carbonyl oxygen. We can draw a resonance form that informs us what to do next. Now the plus charge is on the carbonyl carbon. So we have electrophile in the presence of nucleophile. So we're going to go ahead and have that. Hydroxyl group of the diol attack. So nucleophile attacks electrophile. Now we're still in equilibrium. At this point, the hybridization changes. We are now sp3 hybridized. Now notice the migration of that plus charge. It's now in this oxygen. So in this one step going forward next, I'm going to show two proton transfers at once just to save a little bit of space. Um, but essentially, we have to remove this proton to get this oxygen neutral. We have to protonate this oxygen so we get a good leaving group. So I'm going to show that um, sort of both happening at once. So that's a proton transfer. That oxygen gets protonated. We have water in the system. That's going to act as the base to remove that proton. So now we have that oxygen protonated, this oxygen deprotonated. And so the next thing that happens is an elimination reaction. So remember your, your eliminations, you're forming a pi bond. This oxygen is going to push out water Now we're going to rehybridize back to sp2 hybridized. This oxygen's positively charged. We can use a resonance form again to inform us what to do next. So resonance arrow, that's this double-headed arrow. Carbon or the, the carbonyl carbon is now plus. Here's the alcohol, the other alcohol. That's, that's going to be the nucleophile now. It's going to come down to attack. And usually a good strategy for this is numbering the, the starting the numbering at the nucleophile. So the oxygen's one, 
two, three, four, five, six, and the terminal is the electrophile. So we're forming a six-membered ring just so we're keeping track of what's happening. So again, there's the six-membered ring. I'll put those numbers back in. So you see them. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Those map on the same. And then finally, we're, we're finishing up with one final proton transfer. Again, that's going to use water as the base. to give that oxygen its, its neutral charge and what we see in the, in the product here. So that's the, the mechanistic steps that show the conversion of an aldehyde to an acetal. And again, an acetal is at oxidation state two. We count one, two, that's where we're getting that number. It's functionally equivalent to the aldehyde. However, the hybridization is sp3 hybridized. So if you go on to study biochem, um, the, either the, the one semester or the three semester sequence, these proton transfers that, that are shown in this mechanism are going to be very important to you because that's how a lot of these enzymes work. Um, when, it, when an enzyme is, is forming or cleaving a bond, there's usually some sort of activation by um, an acidic species or, or water. So make sure you understand all of these steps uh, in, in transforming the aldehyde to the acetal. So in the next slide here, let me introduce the types of acetals. So acetal is, is, is a pretty general name. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is, is just show you um, some different versions of that. So maybe what we'll do is, is um, use some actual examples. So this first one is, is a hemi acetal, and, and hemi means essentially half. So let's say we're starting with um, ethanol. And we're going to treat that with, say, um, methanol and water. So this would be called a hemiacetal. And I like to think of the hemi just being OH. So whenever you have hemi in the name, you're going to have OH, and then the other component is coming from the alcohol. So let, let's, let's say we're, we're doing this um, with a ketone variant. So sort of same conditions as we saw, aqueous methanol. So the, these would be considered um, hemiacetals. And these are, these are not just some, you know, abstraction that exists in organic chemistry. These are important. Um, to recognize when we get to the carbohydrates chapter because a lot of carbohydrate chemistry happens <clears throat> at what we call the acetal carbon. So one, one thing you want to be able to do as a skill is when you're looking at this structure, so I, I see the carbon with the oxidation state of 2. I'm just going to write that in blue. So 2, 2. Now, when I'm looking at these substituents, I should be able to say, okay, carbon H, this came from 
an aldehyde. I see in this case, oxidation state two, carbon, carbon, this came from a ketone. So if you weren't given this starting material and you were asked, asked to predict what, what is the carbonyl containing molecule that gives that, you should be able to draw this in this by inspection. So a second sort of acetal is called a hydrate. So for example, we were starting with ethanol again. And then we're just treating with water under aqueous uh, acidic conditions. A hydrate has both OH, OH. So now notice, notice the difference. It's subtle, but it is a difference. Hemiacetal has OH and then some alcohol component. The hydrate has OH, OH. So the same thing for the propanone. This would be considered a hydrate. And so, you know, depending on what, what these R groups are, carbon or hydrogen, or if they're electron withdrawing, um, you know, under, under acidic conditions, one form might be favored over the other just based on how the, the carbon wants to be hybridized. And then uh, the, the acetals or obviously a type of acetal. And so really it, it depends on what sort of alcohol you're using. So if we were using ethanol under acidic conditions, you know, the product of this would be, there's the backbone. We're keeping the oxidation state too. And now both, both of these um, oxygen components come from the solvent ethanol. So you have O-ethyl, O-ethyl. Again, compare that uh, to what you see with the hemiacetal and the hydrate. So again, just to point out, oxidation state 2, 2, we end up with 2 and 2. It's just the nature of what, what these bonds are to the heteroatoms that are different. So these are actually acetals. Uh, and, and, you know, when you look at this, you should be able to dissect that, okay, this comes from 1, 2, 3. This is at an oxidation state of 2, so it's coming from propanone. The O-ethyls are coming from ethanol. So that, that's what you need to be able to dissect when you look at these structures. So acetals, uh, what are they good for? Um, so obviously we're, we're learning this functional group for a reason. So let me present to you a reaction. And I'll, I'll show you the issue with, with this reaction. We're going to start with a difunctional molecule. So we have ketone, we have ester. Let's put in our oxidation states two, three. Now, if we treat this molecule with lithium aluminum hydride, in our solvent of THF, then we do our aqueous workup. Lithium aluminum hydride reduces oxidation state three and oxidation state two compounds all down to oxidation state one. So what does that look like? The ketone becomes 
a secondary alcohol, the ester becomes a primary alcohol. Let me write down the oxidation states. This at oxidation state one, oxidation state one, put in the functional groups, so secondary alcohol, primary alcohol. So that's, that's a fact that this is going to fully reduce those functional groups. But what if you wanted to just reduce the oxidation state 3 down to the primary alcohol and keep the oxidation state 2 at 2? There's really no reducing agent that's going to do that where it's selectively reducing the ester and not the ketone. So let's, let's draw what we're after. We want to make this. We want to keep the ketone intact, and we want to reduce down the ester to the primary alcohol. So again, that proposes a problem because we don't have a reducing agent that we know of that can do that. So we, we actually need to do um, a, a protection of that ketone. So we saw how to do that in the prior slide. So let's, let's go ahead and take ethylene glycol in the presence of sulfuric acid. So we're going we're gonna to drive this. We're going to swap it with ethylene glycol to drive the equilibrium to the product. Now the acetal only reacts at oxidation state 2, so we're covered there. So to map this out, two, three, two. These conditions do not affect the ester. We're only acting upon the oxidation state two. So again, see this O, C, C, O, O, C, C, O. We lose the elements of water in this condensation. We're keeping that at oxidation state two. It's now protected. We can now reduce this down using the lithium aluminum hydride. Just to show where those hydrogens come from, they come from the hydride. This is still protected. Let's write in, we'll keep track of our oxidation states, two, one. And then finally, to get to our desired product here, we're going to remove um, the, the acetal, basically by, by now running the reaction in, in water. We're swamping it with water. We have a catalytic amount of sulfuric acid. So we're pushing the equilibrium to remove the acetal and unmask it back to the ketone. So again, two, one, there's the oxidation states. So these conditions essentially, because we can run it in reverse, we're unmasking it and we end up with our desired ketone. So acetals are useful as a protecting group if we want to conserve the oxidation state. So just to wrap up this screencast, uh, we can also use um, sulfur as the nucleophile. So thioacetals, uh, these have special purpose and in, in undergo chemistry that the oxygen acetals do not. 
So for example, if we look at this, this ketone and we treat with this dithiol in the presence of this Lewis acid BF3 etherate, we use THF as our solvent. So again, oxidation state two, we're gonna lose the elements of H2O. So this is a thioacetal. Again, we're still at oxidation state two. Now, what these thioacetals will do that the oxygens will not is they can fully reduce that oxidation state down uh, to zero when you treat with hydrogen gas in the presence of this catalyst called rainy, rainy nickel. And so this would be run in ethanol as the solvent. So the transition metal catalyst, rainy nickel, is going to reduce that fully down to zero. So you end up with the alkane functional group. So now we're at zero. And again, we're at zero because there's no heteroatoms bonded to that carbon anymore. So that's a special reaction of the thioacetals is that you can fully reduce it off. And again, that's, that's part of a synthetic strategy if we we're trying to make something complex. So uh, in, in this screencast, we've looked at you know, the chemistry of acetals. In the next screencast, we'll look at um, the chemistry of aminals where we're using nitrogen nucleophiles.